Greg, welcome back, everyone. How was uh, your fall break? Was it energizing or you were catching up with everything from the first part of the semester? Anyone saw the eclipse? Yeah, was it cool? I didn't see it. <laughs> I went up north to Yellowstone and I took this photo of a bear's tracks in uh, in some yellow algae that I'm very proud of, and I had to show it show it today. Um, so no eclipse for us. Um, all right, so let's go over a few things before we get into a new topic. So first, I'm gonna go over your mid-course feedback and thanks to everyone who has submitted one. Uh, first, over some good things. It seems that uh, you like some of the aspects of this course and I appreciate your kind words. It's nice to actually read them. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't know whether you like things you said you liked and it seems like you appreciate the topics and uh, switching back between the discussions and lectures. Uh, some of you said you like assignments. Few of you uh, uh, had uh, some concerns that I will go uh, over and websites uh, and recordings. Uh, so now, in terms of things that are not really working well, uh, it seems to me that most of them are something I can take and then improve the course for the next iteration of this course, not something I can uh, improve on right now. Um, first one is the obvious issue of this room not really being suitable for discussion. Uh, first, the problem is in the uh, in the sound, um, where you know if I don't have a microphone and I'm standing over to here and the presenter is standing over here, you probably don't hear me. Um, but also, you know, we can't really make nice little tables or stuff like that. So um, yeah, definitely something I can I can approve on next uh, for the next iteration. You don't obviously like having two deadlines simultaneously, and this is actually something that's a little bit tricky to achieve if we want to have both these discussions and lectures and you know one following the others and also prepare you for the project. Uh, so not really sure how to fix that one. Um, you want more examples? Totally, uh, totally reasonable. Second related paper seems to be a little bit much too much when we have those paper discussions. And I will think about this a little bit. I think we can maybe fix this for um, the next paper discussions where I can ask the um, person assigned to that role to actually maybe prepare a write up or a presentation, whatever they like, but not actually present it. Uh, in class, and then we can focus more on those wild card, card, wild card rules. I was actually surprised that you have used those wild card rules so much, which I really appreciate. I was expecting no one will actually do those, so uh, this this was a positive surprise in the in the discussions. Um, so yeah, definitely uh, I will rearrange that a little bit. Um, I also acknowledge that the time that was needed for different assignments was really varying so for some one assignment it needed way more time than for the other and that's totally on me because I just wrote these assignments as I was preparing the lecture so um, I didn't really consider how much time each one would take and uh, uh, that that's something that can be obviously improved for the next version now that we have the draft of the assignments um, also related to that uh, I, I see whoever wrote this that you know, you spend a lot of time actually putting everything in a format that I can then evaluate where it might have been better to spend that time actually writing the code, extra code for whatever we you were looking into. So yeah, that was definitely uh, overlooked on my side. Some of you want more math. Um, some of you want concrete user studies of explanations earlier, more resources for non-CS students. Um, you know, mechanisms to think about projects earlier. All of that is something that can be improved for future uh, course versions. And of course, having no TA um, is an issue and that's not an issue that um, is easily solved because as you can see, the topic that we are covering here are a little bit specialized and are a little high level. You already need to know NLP well and machine learning well, deep learning well, and finding a student who is still here um, and who is looking for TA positions and knows and can help me is actually a little bit hard. Um, so yeah, besides this point, I don't think there is much I can improve for you right now, but I do want to thank you all for giving me this feedback because that will certainly make this 
course better uh, in the in the future. And I wanted to go over this just to show you that we really read this and we really think about how we can uh, make the course better for you and for the uh, future versions. If anyone feels comfortable and you want to add something to this, I'm happy to hear it out. Yeah, please. Like, uh, just like an estimate deadline on when the assignments will be graded. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, that brings me to my next slide, and that does sound terribly slow with grading these assignments. And I do not have anything to tell you except to apologize for that. I just do not have enough capacity to to uh, uh, grade these assignments faster. And I wish I can, because I think it's important to give you, you know, immediate feedback. Um, so yeah, I'm still working through them and I'll try to speed up and I'll try to prioritize this, but uh, it's just taking a while. If you have any specific questions, any of you that are important to you to know about your homework before you start working on your projects, please let me know. I'm happy to meet with you and go over uh, you know, your, I, I can, you know, prepare uh, for the meeting and grade your assignment and, you know, show you whatever you are interested in. Um, yeah, it's the problem of not having a TA basically for this class. Yeah, I'm really, really sorry about that. Um, but I did want to, before we go into the projects, kind of go over what was the purpose of these homeworks, just to remind you. So the goal before be, behind the first assignment was to prepare you to know how to fine tune a model. And we need a model because we are explaining a model. Um, so with the first assignment, you learn how to fine tune one kind of an NLP model, and you have learned it to do it in a way that we would do if you were you if you were an NLP researcher or a developer. So you work with the server, you, you use the editor, terminal, all of those things. You then have looked into how to programmatically prompt uh, a model. And here we also include a little bit of vision just for you to experience how it is to deal with images. Uh, so this is just a kind of um, building up on the first homework to, you can explain a model you fine tuned or you can explain a model you don't want to fine tune, you will just use it uh, in this few shot or a zero shot setup. So that prepared you with like knowing how to actually deal with models. And then we move into trying one explainability method, namely gradient based highlighting. And here from your Piazza post, you might have already noticed maybe yourself or from other students, how finicky and unreliable these things can be. I think uh, some of you maybe have come with an impression that you know, these things are re reliable and that they work and that they are kind of done in terms of researching them. Uh, but I think this homework hell has shown you that these things are really finicky and it's really hard to understand sometimes when we get the outputs of these explainability methods. And that's what I wanted you to realize that um, it's, it's not something we use off shelf and it simply works really well for us. Uh, also, you have encountered the problem of making these visualizations really nice, right? Uh, uh, I can give you that simple code that just makes bar plots, but uh, that wasn't really nice because then uh, if the input is really long, your bar plot becomes ridiculous and it's really hard to read it. And you, some of you have encountered issues with when the inputs are long, gradient-based highlighting can take very long time to compute and stuff like that. So these are all normal issues you would encounter if you were using this for your research. So obvious solution here is to write code to make this visualization nicer or adopt some of those that are already you available in Captain, but those are, it's not really trivial. They are there and you really want to use their visualizations because they're better, but it's not like a line of code you just apply to your thing. And that's another thing I want to, wanted you to realize that actually producing these outputs is, is not uh, as simple as it might seem. And final homework was about trying to apply an explainability method when you need to combine multiple code bases. And I don't know where you were with that, but I hope you have seen that if you have your hugging face code and if you ha don't have a nice wrapper around it and you don't really have the exact problem as it was described in the captain tutorial, it's a little bit trickier to, to make it work as well. So. With all of these homeworks, you kind of gone through the experience of a person who is doing NLP explainability research, basically. These are all weird situations 
uh, that we usually uh, encounter. And I kind of wanted you to go through that journey before you start working on your projects such that you have a little bit more reasonable expectations of what you can do with your projects. Okay, so again, I apologize, still didn't grade these and I, I really will make it, you know, steady effort to, to grade them from now on because even in, in now in the lectures, you will have a lot of in-class uh, activities. So I have less preparing for the lectures to do and that will give me a little bit more time. Okay, so any questions about homeworks besides where are our grades? No. Okay, so uh, final thing I wanna go over, almost final thing I wanna go over is uh, projects. I really want to remind you of the timeline for your projects. Uh, I have sent today an announcement uh, where with uh, team formation. So you all should know which team you belong to today. Um, and on this basis that we will have in-class activity where you are going to uh, fill in that project proposal that I have shared uh, with you. Um, so basically we will meet here and you and your teammate will discuss what you wanna do. And then you are going to fill in that document and submit that document to Gradescope at the end of the class. And that's going to serve as your project proposal that I will give uh, feedback on immediately. Um, yeah, I don't wanna go over all of these. I just want to kind of give you a visualization of uh, how much work there will be. And I also want you to notice that there are a lot of in-class activities we are going to do. So uh, although this might seem like a lot, there is also a lot of opportunity to work on this uh, in the class. Questions about projects? All right. Okay, and just on the small thing, uh, this Wednesday we are going to finish five to 10 minutes earlier because uh, we have a great opportunity to attend the talk by Elizabeth Churchill, who is a senior director at uh, Google. And she will give a presentation uh, about um, kind of like a very high uh, overlook and comment on the HCI. And you will see today that HCI is becoming very central to the uh, explainability research as well. Everything we are going to talk about today will have HCI flavor. So um, if you're interested in this space of how to evaluate explanations, this is indeed very relevant uh, presentation. But even you know, without that, I think this is a great opportunity to hear someone who knows so much about certain topics. So I definitely recommend going there. And then on next Wednesday, uh, we will not have class in person because I travel uh, and I will share materials for you to learn on your on your own. Okay, any questions before we go into a new topic? Okay, then um, let's let's start with that. So today we are going to talk about explanation and evaluation. And although we have talked about evaluation explanation, you know, after every explainability method we have introduced, now we are going to shift our focus uh, to, to methods that are more uh, suitable. So that's kind of vague what I'm saying right now, but it will become more apparent uh, in a second. Um, I want you to think about the evaluation of explanations through this taxonomy that's uh, proposed by these two researchers, Doshi Velez and Kim. Um, and they have proposed this taxonomy where you have these three level or th three different categories of evaluations of explanations. And they are, uh, we, we are starting from least specific and costly, and we are going to more specific and costly, where more specific means that you are more directly targeting the evaluation of explanations. So you say my explanation, my explainability method that I'm introducing will achieve something. And usually you see, say it's going to achieve something to a certain person. Uh, very often people say something that's quite vague, but something like it's going to increase trust of people in AI. So if that's your goal with your explainability, you should be evaluating that, whether your explainability method is indeed increasing trust, whatever that means, of people in AI. Okay, so at the bottom we have so-called functionality grounded, then we have human grounded and application grounded, 
And here there are two factors that are making a difference between these three categories, whether they use actual people to do evaluation and whether they are using the actual task, um, meaning here uh, in the example with trust, whether you are evaluating actual trust or something else, a proxy for trust. So this is going to uh, be, these two factors are going to differentiate these three classes, but we are going to go over each one of them in detail now. And we're going to start with functionality, functionality grounded evaluation where we don't have real humans and we have proxy tasks. So usually in this space, people, ML researcher, machine learning uh, people will say, oh, there is some notion of explainability that's really important. Our explainability method must have this property for our, to achieve something. Um, so for example, very often, uh, you know, years back, uh, people have talked about sparsity as a feature of explainability. So if you had, 50 input features, and if your solution was sparse, in the end, you would end up with two features, let's say, being important. Your solution was sparser, and therefore it will, it kind of carried out some explainability because then people can understand which factors were really important. So sparsity was the quality of explainability we cared about, and we could evaluate it automatically, right? We didn't need to tell a people, uh, uh, we didn't need people to tell us how sparse our solution is. We could have automated out, uh, automatically, excuse me, evaluate it uh, automatically. Um, and this is appropriate when your explainability method and your field is not really mature. So you know you are, what you care about is whether people can do something with that sparse solution, whether they can now do certain tasks in their real life better, but you're not actually evaluating that, you are evaluating just the level of sparsity you get. And this, is, this was fine if you don't really, if you can't really produce a task, an explainability method that can be conceivable to be used uh, in the real world. Challenges of for course, determining what proxies to use. I have gave you an example of sparsity. And once you have determined the, the uh, whatever proxy for quality you are interested in, the, then the challenge is how to optimize for that uh, specific uh, proxy. So with a, a sparsity, there is a whole line of method that aims to uh, give sparse solutions. And um, there are varying methods how to go about this. Uh, that all stem from different strategies of how to optimize for that proxy. Um, I gave you an example of sparsity. Another example would be, for example, to show that inherently interpretable model, such as a linear model with a, a you know, reasonable number of input features that are all interpretable or very short decision uh, trees uh, perform as good as uh, non-interpretable alternatives. And here in that first example, the factor would be uh, this formal definition of interpretability would be uh, that the model is inherently uh, interpretable. And the second example is the one that I have already given you. Okay, so any questions about this? Okay. So this is one category of evaluation of explanation. The second category is so-called uh, by, you know, Doshi Valez and Kim, uh, human grounded evaluation, where you have actual people, where you ask people something about explanations you have produced, but you're still not targeting the exact motivation you have introduced explanation for. So if you have introduced explanations for increasing trust, let's say you don't actually ask these people about their trust in the model, you are still doing something different. And why would we even do that? Why not immediately target our you know, end goal? Well, these, these experiments with people are usually simpler than those that we should actually be doing. And, um, and they are usually uh, not requiring experts, such as doctors, journalists, fact checkers. So that means that these evaluations are also more cheap to do. Not only that, but they also enable you to recruit a bigger pool of human subjects, because if you don't need to recruit actual doctors, you might find many, many more other 
people who are not doctors to actually do this task for you on, let's say, platforms such as Amazon Mechanical Turk. So simplicity, cost, and the size of the of the recruitment pool you can achieve is the reason you want to do this. And there are many examples of this, some of which we are already mentioned in the class. I would put the overlap between automated and human author highlights here, although I'm honestly not 100% sure whether they fit here or on, on the uh, functionality uh, evaluation, just because human authored come from people, but when you do evaluation, it becomes automatic once you have once collected human authored explanations. So the explanations stem from people, but now that some have, some have people have collected them, you and I will just measure the overlap, which is uh, automated metrics. But I think still because explanations come from people, I would put it here, although it's a little bit iffy. More clear cases are, for example, when we talked about evaluating plausibility of free text explanations, we have said that we are going to collect human judgments on crowdsourcing platforms on whether an explanation justifies an answer. So we, we put our templates on Amazon Mechanical Turk, uh, we recruit some people, we give them uh, a hit where they get 10 examples of our explanations, and they tell for each one of them whether they deem that that explanation justifies whatever the uh, prediction model has given us. So here, this is real humans means, yes, we actually have human annotators, but it's a proxy task because someone can tell you, yeah, this task justifies, uh, excuse me, this explanation justifies this sensor, but it doesn't tell us whether that's actually useful for them. It can justify the answer, but this person still might might not make any use of that explanation that they deem that justifies the answer. So it's still not, you know, directly evaluating what we care about. Um, another similar evaluation is that we again recruit lay people on crowdsourcing platforms such as Amazon Mechanical Turk, and uh, we ask them. We give them two explanations and we ask which one they prefer from these two, where the first explanation is the one you produce, and the second explanation is whatever baseline explainability method you try to uh, outperform. This has also lately been um, automatized. So instead of having real humans, we have a proxy human, uh, namely GPT-4, simulating this evaluator that we would usually recruit on the Amazon Mechanical Turk. And you give GPT-4 your explanation, an explanation from your competitor explainability method, and you ask GPT, excuse me, not ask, from GPT to um, output which one of these explanations is better. And usually, you know, researchers would show at least once a correlation between human judgments and uh, out of major metrics judgment. And that's the reason why um, it is allowed to use GPT-4 instead of uh, a human. However, I really want you to uh, be cautious with using GPT-4 as a proxy for a human. So uh, although people have shown that there is some correlation between GPT-4s and human judgments of explanation plausibility, um, a lot of other work has shown that GPT-4 picks on very uh, funky patterns, such as um, GPT-4, excuse me, GPT-4 prefers uh, longer outputs. So if you give it a longer generation and shorter generation, it will, it will prefer the longer one. And you might think, oh, my longer generation is more of higher quality for whatever task you are evaluating text summarization or uh, translation or here explanation plausibility, but actually all the, the GPT-4 looks for is this length, which is doesn't have anything to do with the quality actually. So I recommend checking this very, very recent paper that really quantifies this effect uh, very well. And I think this is really good reason to be cautious about using GPT-4 as a proxy for a human. Question about questions about that. A lot has been said about this one bullet point. 
Okay, and the final example, which is really important to know is forward or, and I should have said here and uh, contrafactual uh, simulation. Uh, so let me go over this metric. So these metrics are very often used to evaluate explanations. And sometimes people will say this is a way to uh, evaluate uh, explanation plausibility. Sometimes they will say, oh, it's the way to evaluate faithfulness. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it fits any of these categories very nicely. So I would think about it as um, just a metric of human grounded uh, evaluation of explanation quality without specifying uh, whether we mean plausibility or not. And it works like this. It, uh, it is a measure of, uh, of uh, ability of a person or sometimes another model to simulate the outcome of the AI on an instance level. Here, idea is if your explanation shows the uh, model's reasoning, then uh, expl including explanations should help people have a better mental model of how the model behaves. And therefore, they should better guess what would model predict for a given instance than if they didn't have an explanation shown. Specifically, you will have a model that you are explaining, and that model for a given input will give you some label. Then you will use some explainability method, and this method might take any of these model input and label. For example, gradient-based highlights require access to the model and given an input and uh, model's uh, prediction, it will show us which parts of the input were uh, important and that's going to be explanation. Now, you're going to give to some person your input and explanation of a model's prediction and you will ask this person to guess what the model will predict for this input given this explanation. And you want to show that the uh, whatever person guesses here is with a higher rate what the model had actually predicted. Um, what I should have written here, but I didn't, you will also have a person do this task without explanation. And then you will compare how good a person can simulate what the model would guess with and without explanation and ideally with the explanation, the simulation rate would be higher. Okay, um, does this make sense? So yeah, this is this is one metric that you will keep, keep seeing and see uh, in uh, explainability world. So it's really uh, important to know what's going on here. Um, I have also mentioned here work uh, from last year that tries to do this where instead of a human, again, we are moving from human grounded to functionality uh, evaluations, where instead of a human, we have a mo another model uh, that tries to uh, estimate what the uh, what, uh, uh, other model that we are explaining would say the label is. And here they give you guidelines of how to do this appropriately uh, to kind of um, remove some of the confounders. I think if you have budget to use people to do this for you, do it. Uh, it's, you know, alleviates some of these confounders that might uh, happen. But also when we are developing models and when we are developing explainability methods, we have a lot of hyperparameters, right? And you cannot do human evaluation for every single little hyperparameter you want to examine. So what I recommend is, yeah, maybe you use these uh, simulation metrics with another model using these extra guidelines given in this paper when you need to choose which hyperparameters you are going to use. But for your final choice of all of your hyperparameters and the final explainability method, go and do actual human evaluation by recruiting people on crowdsourcing platforms. So yeah. Sometimes people are a little bit strict about saying these automatic metrics are mm, useless or whatever. I think the use in the intermediate development uh, is actually, you know, it, it makes sense then to use these methods uh, for this intermediate development. Okay, we mentioned forwards uh, simulatability and there is another one, contrafactual. Here, uh, we want to approximate a person's understanding of model behavior by accessing whether a person can change the model. So the 
underlying uh, motivation for the measurement uh, for the measurement is the same as with forward simulatability, where you want to test whether a person is gaining a better uh, understanding of or a mental model of the model's behavior by seeing explanations. And before, we just wanted to see uh, kind of measure the this understanding by seeing whether the person can can um, guess the model's prediction. But here we are also going kind of a step deeper by seeing whether the person can tweak the input such that it produces uh, the model's prediction. So again, we are going to have our model make a prediction. We are going to have our explainability producing an explanation. We are going to have a person uh, tweaking the input such that they, um, they um, um, okay, uh, excuse me, I need to stop here because I said mistake before. Uh, we are, the person is trying to change the input such that it changes the model's prediction to whatever other label the evaluator had set. So for example, if he had positive and sentiment uh, 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 labels and we had the sentiment uh, classifier, Let's say that the person he, uh, that the model had predicted positive sentiment label here. We will then ask a person to change the input such that the model predicts a negative sentiment label, which is the opposite label, opposite label choice. So here we are going to have uh, here uh, the goal is that the person changes the input such that uh, we produce a new label set by a person who is conducting evaluation. For example, me, I'm an NLP researcher and I set what this other label will be. Okay, that was a mistake. So I just wanna make sure that you can follow what's going on here. I see some confused eyebrows, although the rest of your face might have another motion. So are we clear on what's going on here? It seems a little bit intimidating, I think, because there are multiple steps, but um, and there is nothing too complicated here. You know, have a model doing its own prediction. You have an explanation. Have a person that tries to change the input such that the model predicts another another label that you have uh, set for them. Okay, um, hopefully that's kind of clear. Again, oh. Exactly. Yeah. So input such that the the same explanation she told. Except that the on yeah, you're right. So before we went to a full break, we talked about contrastive editing, a um, means to explain a model where you make automatically an edit of the input such that the model's prediction changes to, to another one. And uh, we said that these kinds of edits can help people understand what is going on with this model. So. Although related, this here we have a slightly different situation. We are, and, and to some extent, I think the underlying idea is similar that these um, contrafactual um, or contrastive edits are the way that people think about uh, things. So here um, we want to see whether the explanation enables a person to produce such edits, because if they have a good understanding of the model, they will be able to do such edits, right? So of course here, if we have shown them contrastive edits, probably, and if our contrastive edits are really good and they really can flip the label uh, and they are not super long, people can easily grasp them, then I think here quickly people could do uh, this kind of intervention that will produce the uh, second, uh, the, the other label. I think with that, with what I just said, using contrastive edits here, you do have a confounder of whether people just repeat these edits 
and your edits are good. So they're not gaining any understanding. They just realize they can copy paste the edits. So in that situation, I wouldn't use contrafactual simulatability as the sole metric for your contrastive edits evaluation. I will also use, for example, forward simulatability. Okay, so this uh, the, the contrafactual one, we kind of wrap this part where we have human grounded evaluation. We have real real people, uh, but they are not doing the exact evaluation of explanation that we care about. They are doing some proxy evaluation. And the holy grail, the, the one that we really should be doing is called or by Dr. Valez and Kim, application grounded evaluations, where we have actual real people doing the task and real uh, tasks that they are doing where explanation would be potentially helpful. Um, so in this paper, they say, if the researcher has a concrete application in mind, such as working with doctors on diagnosing patients with a particular disease, the best way to show that the model works is to evaluate it with respect to that task, doctors performing diagnosis, right? And that kind of makes uh, a lot of sense, I would say. So it directly tests the objective that the system is built for, but, and we should, uh, and performance with respect to that objective gives strong evidence of success, right? So if we show that explanations are helpful to doctors performing diagnosis uh, better, then um, that's it. That's what why we introduce them, uh, introduce them for. And when I when I said this and I write, when I wrote this slide, I was like, okay, I mean, this is super obvious to do, right? Like, why is not everyone literally doing this? Why is not everyone using these tasks and evaluating them with actual people who are doing this task in the real world? And for this, you need a little bit of historical perspective. So NLP explainability has or has had unique challenges. For most features are a sequence of high dimensional non-interpretable vectors. So every token in your input is very high uh, dimensional vector. And each dimension in this vector doesn't mean anything. It is just a number. You don't know whether it captures any linguistic phenomenon at all. Um, and this is opposed to pre-neural methods where you had input features that were interpretable. Before we had neural networks, we would design features such as um, which word is a subject, which word is an object, is there, I don't know, um, certain phenomenon, whatever, uh, does it exist or not? It would be like one, one or zero. And so if you use the linear model in the end, or SVM, you would in the end know which by the weights of your linear model, which one of these were important. And this is something we cannot do uh, in NLP. We also have an arbitrary number of features because features are input tokens. The longer your text is, the more features you have. So you could have anything from one to many, 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 many features. Uh, we have continuous representations of discrete inputs. This is not something we talked a lot in or at all in this course, uh, but for example, if you want to add small perturbation to your input um, with images, for example, if you add small noise to your input, you get similarly looking image, right? Let's take a sentence such as um, birds fly. You take an embedding, a token uh, representation of word birds, and you end, uh, add a small noise to it, you can add to another vector of another animal, let's say dog is the most, is the closest nearest uh, embedding to, to the one you have produced. And now you have a sentence with the meaning dogs fly, which has no semantic meaning, right? So this is also a challenge. These small perturbations in input can cause very weird behaviors, which is very different from images. So when people try to apply explainability methods from images, and um, here, what I'm having in mind are, for example, adversarial attacks. Achieving that for uh, text wasn't so easy. 
Now we have a challenge also of explaining models with billions of parameters. And we have seen that that's an issue computationally with uh, influence functions, uh, for example. We also have pre-trained models. So we are not only attributing behavior to the fine tuning data, but also to a large pool of our pre-trained uh, data. And we have talked about different weird behaviors that might uh, emerge. And then we have inherently interpretable models performing nowhere close to large language models. So um, we really had to focus on, on the models that are actually working well for NLP. So prior NLP explainability work has mostly focused on overcoming these challenges. The focus was on let's build the methods that do not, that overcome these issues. And um, another orthogonal point to the point that we have, you know, that we had to solve these challenges is that many realistic applications of language technology have become both evident and possible only with recent advances. You know, it's kind of hard to imagine that three years from before now in 2020, GPT-3, that was a pure language model with next word prediction only, had been released. Uh, it seems like ages ago, I think from the perspective of today, because so much has happened, but three to four years ago, we couldn't imagine that this day we will have things that work so well. So people and researchers specifically narrowed their focus on things they actually could do. And you couldn't train a model to do an actual task doctors would use well. The performance was just too low. So idea of application ground and evaluation, I'm sure was on people's mind and like ultimate goal, but it's not like you could have trained a model for certain you know, prediction of certain diagnosis very well, where you can actually ask people to engage with this model in any meaningful way. You really had to narrow your focus. However, today, both explainability methods had overcome some of these challenges. I mean, we are talking about these methods. We, we have some something, right? It's not like we don't have uh, anything that can't work with uh, NLP tasks that all have these uh, challenges. And now we also have some ideas about how these language models could be useful in the real world. So now it's this pivotal moment in, in research where um, there is a prevailing perspective that not having application grounded evaluations must change, that we now need application grounded evaluations of explain, uh, explainability methods. So if you are entering this explainability field, you have an idea for new explainability method that's completely valid, but you should expect that people who are going to review your paper will expect a little bit more extra on the evaluation side because there is an urge from the community that we see more of that. So, and that also comes from the fact that these explainability methods we talked about in the first part of the course kind of uh, have shown proof of concept tests, I would call uh, that. We have used those non-application grounded evaluations. And we have shown that to some extent, these things uh, work. Although in your assignments, you have also seen that they have plenty of issues uh, as well. So yeah, want to emphasize this, uh, that we really, really need these application grounded uh, evaluations. And one common setup uh, for human application grounded evaluation is to think about human AI collaboration or human AI teams. Um, today we want in these more high risk situations, we want actual experts to collaborate with these AI models. And people will say AI models have their own strengths and experts have their other strengths. And we want them to collaborate together and we want these teams to be better than the sole components, person alone or AI model alone. So this is a setup, This up, when we say applica application, um, think about this framework where you have a model, a trained model that's not interpretable, uh, but we are giving some kind of explanations of this model. And we have another person that gets the prediction of this model and then they make the final predictions. Um, so yeah, have this set up in mind. Now I will go over 
few application grounded evaluation measurements we can actually do with this setup. So I will go over a few of those. Any questions about what we have seen here or this setup or how this setup is an application? No, that's clear. Okay. All right, so the first measurement we are going to talk about is reliance. And we say reliance, we actually mean uh, three measurements, under-reliance, over-reliance, and appropriate reliance, and we'll go over each one of them. So we'll start with other under-reliance. It's very often assumed that model is deemed trustworthy based on its performance. And it's very often asserted that explanations can deter people from rejecting correct predictions. And explanations are introduced because explanations are anticipated to unveil the correct reasoning behind models assumed to be correct predictions. And the way that we measure explanation usefulness then is the average rate at which people reject correct predictions with and without the provision of explanations. And you want this rejection rate to be as low as possible. And you wanna show that by including explanations the, the rate at which we reject correct prediction uh, has lowered because explanations have shown us right reasons behind models correct predictions. More specifically, I apologize that this is a little bit grainy. These are the, this is the measurement you're calculating. You are calculating the rate um, at which we reject predictions that are correct. So here, the denominator is a set of all inputs we have for which the model makes the right prediction. So here, this is a gold label. So these are all the correct predictions. So for each one of the correct predictions, you are checking whether a person is going to reject them. Um, and then you are going to compare the rate at which people reject um, uh, uh, reject correct predictions uh, relative to some baseline. So this baseline could be no explanation. So you are giving a person just the input and the model prediction, and you ask them to say whether this is correct or wrong. And for each one of the correct model pre uh, predictions, you check whether what is the rate at which person rejected them relative to a setup that we care about where person actually sees explanation, EP is an explanation. Um, so this can be no explanation, but much better is to use model confidence, which is the first type of explainability um, assistance that we talked about. Remember, we have talked about calibration and how we can show model confidence in a way that actually represents the probability uh, related to uh, that prediction. Okay, is that clear? So everything that's written here is what was written in this one sentence. So I don't know what is easier for you to read the sentence, the average rate at which people reject the uh, correct predictions with and without provision of explanations and uh, equations that uh, say that as well. I wanna go a little bit more into this uh, baseline though. Um, so a lot of people have used no explanation or no, no extra information except the model's prediction uh, as, a, as a baseline control. And they compare whether adding an explanation is better than that. Um, however, uh, Banzal and Guetal had really made a strong case to use model confidence. Um, they say, first of all, it's a stronger and more broadly acknowledged baseline. So why would you use a baseline that's not as strong as possible, right? Um, that's how we do things in machine learning. We don't pick a baseline that's easy. We pick the baseline that's the strongest we have. Usually it's the prior work state of the art. And here we have models confidence. And we wanna show that uh, our explanations are better better than that. Um, they say most ma machine learning models can generate confidence scores that in practice correlate with models true likelihood to do errors. I 
think this is a little bit too strong because we have talked a lot about this in that lecture where we where I introduced uncertainty estimation and we have learned about the way to quantify whether your uncertainty or confidence estimates are correct. And we have talked about how uh, this um, rate at which um, uncertainty estimation is correct can be lowered if we have domain shift, for example. So I would say that um, I agree it's a strong baseline, but I would maybe tone it down with, you know, being really the uh, uh, strongly correlating with the models true. Uh, likelihood to uh, do errors, you know, uh, in any task. They made a reference to one specific work and great that there it works, but that doesn't mean that this works in every single uh, task domain modality we care about. Um, and there is plenty of work that says that displaying uncertainty in predictions can help users make more optimal decisions. So they say, and I very much so agree that our focus should be on evaluating whether explanations provide additional value to the confidence score. So I really hope that all of you, if you ever do any kind of explainability research after this class, and you are doing any kind of evaluation that you are comparing to the um, control where you get models prediction and the confidence scores. Okay, moving on. A complement to under-reliance is over-reliance. So we can assume that the model is imperfect. And I think this is way more solid assumption to make than that the model is really, really solid. And our goal is to aid people in rejecting incorrect predictions with explanations. And why we believe that explanations have a power to do so? Well, we believe that, um, I think it's a, it's a reasonable expectation to have that explanations present information that appears illogical or self-contradictory or inconsistent with what the person already knows. Uh, so when the model is incorrect, explanation might, uh, assuming that our explainability method works well, it should break down with, uh, with the incorrect prediction in a sense that it will show us information, uh, bad reasons behind the model's prediction. So by doing that, we can uh, measure the explanation usefulness for um, you know, combating over the lines by measuring the average rate at which people uh, accept incorrect predictions. And we want to show that this rate lowers when we show people explanations. So again, we have very similarly looking equations. Now we have a set of all evaluation instances for which the model makes incorrect predictions because IP is different than I, which is our gold label. And then for all of them, we check whether the model, uh, excuse me, not the model, whether the person had accepted that uh, prediction to be correct. Uh, and we compare the rate, this rate at which person accepts incorrect predictions uh, relative to our baseline, which can be uh, no explanation baseline, or as we have just learned, it's better to use confidence scores as the baseline. Okay, clear? Very similar to under reliance. Okay, obviously, under reliance is unwanted. Over reliance is unwanted, but it's not like one is more important than the other. We don't want either of these things. So, what we actually care about, what our ultimate goal is, is so-called appropriate reliance, where we want people accept correct predictions and dismiss uh, wrong ones. So in that human AI theme uh, framework that I showed you where a doctor is making a diagnosis for a patient, we want this doctor to just quickly know, oh, these are correct or these are incorrect predictions. And when they see incorrect predictions, they are going to invest their time into Correct, you know, doing that, doing do those examples themselves, where when they deem that the prediction is correct, they will just pass it on to the patient. And explanation usefulness here is the average rate at which people do so, this, uh, you know, two conditionals. And we want this uh, rate to increase with a provision of explanations. So again, if you want uh, equations, we would, uh, for each example in our uh, evaluation set, so here we are including all of them, we are going to check whether this had happened, whether in case that this is an example where the model makes a correct prediction, 
uh, we want to check whether a person had accepted that uh, prediction. And in the case that this was incorrect models prediction, we want to check whether a person had rejected them. If this happens, we are going to count one, otherwise we are not counting anything. So in the end, we are counting how many time, times this favorable situation had occurred in an our evaluation set. And we want, again, compare this uh, rate with our explanations and without them, just with the baseline explanations. And we want this to be, uh, uh, you know, that th we want this rate to increase. I said this is weaker because here the person is just saying this is correct or wrong. We are never asking persons to correct the wrong prediction. And a more stricter reliance would be where we also require the person to say what the uh, what the you know their prediction of the label is when they deem that the model is incorrect. So here we also require from person to make the the correct prediction uh, in the end. Imagine that doctor making predictions together with the model. In the end, they must tell to the patient what the diagnosis is. They don't just tell the AI model was wrong or correct. They actually correct the AI model when AI is wrong, which is actually more uh, realistic setup, but it's also more strict because you require a person to do that final guess well, and they might be, you know, they might not have power to, to do that. Mm. Okay, um, before I move forward, I wanna tell you more things about appropriate reliance. Um, is it clear what we are measuring here? Good. Okay, so I set these equations for you, but it's still ongoing research of how to do these things well. So for example, this year, uh, two researchers have said, well, this all must be quantified relative to the expected performance of a model and a person. And what they mean by that, they say it is acceptable if a person always accepts predictions of a model that's superhuman. So imagine you train a model that's exceptionally good at the task, way better than a human is. Um, here they say, well, you can, the person can just accept these predictions. And an alternative is that the model, um, not alternative because there is a third option. Another option is that the model is terrible. We just have a task that's super hard for a model and the model is very, very far from the performance of a human. Here they say it's always acceptable to reject predictions. So we don't care about cases where, for example, if we have superhuman model, we don't really care about cases where the model is wrong. And in previous equation, we do care in those cases. We, we check what would happen, what would person decide in these cases. Following the paradigm in this paper, we simply do not care. We say that uh, the basically the over reliance outcome based over reliance outcome based meaning on these individual cases where the superhuman uh, model is wrong. We don't care about over reliance in these cases. All we care about person's interaction with this kind of model is under reliance. And other way around, if we have a subhuman uh, model here, we don't really care on these few examples where this very bad model is correct, what the person would say. Uh, we just care about uh, over the lines um, person might have uh, on this kind of a model. And they say that the measurements I have showed you before, they call them outcome-based outcome risk lines because for every single outcome on every single example, we check what happens with reliance. Whereas their proposal is what's called, or what they coin as strategy-based reliance. And this is very new proposal. So something to have in mind, you might not necessarily uh, agree with this. I think it makes uh, makes sense to, to measure reliance according to the performance of the model as well. Questions about that? Okay. I don't know why this froze. Okay. Okay. So um, 
I want to go over more details. So here, I told you that we are checking the rate at which, um, I'm sorry, I don't know why this is slow. OK. Um, we are checking the rate at which um, appropriate reliance is achieved with the baseline explanation and then with the addition of our actual explanation. And I don't know how much you can follow now, but that's a little bit vague. And specifically, it's vague in a, in a way that we can um, go about uh, measuring these two different measuring these two um rates i'm i apologize i really don't know why this is slow so the first thing you can do is or one thing you can do is have two groups you can have a group of people you have recruited that all they see is ai's recommendation ai's prediction and its confidence in its prediction and you have another group of people who see AI's recommendations, its confidence, and the explanation. And then you do make them do the, um, the task they need to do, namely they interact with this model and then they tell you whether they accept or reject the prediction. You quantify real appropriate reliance the way we have seen just a few slides ago. And then you compare the reliance across these two groups. You just make the subtract the reliance of one group uh, from the other and you expect or you want your reliance of the second group uh, to be better. And you want its under reliance and over reliance to be lower. So that's one way to go about this. The other way about to go about this is to do it sequentially. So you have one person who is first seeing only the prediction, and then it sees the maybe, excuse me, sees the prediction and the confidence, and they make whatever guess about uh, accepting or rejecting, and then you show them explanation, and then you ask them to guess again. And you compare how their guesses change with the provision of explanation. So. Uh, the difference here is that you have in group one and group two here, you can have completely different people. I can split this classroom in two groups and have group one on the left do task, uh, see only prediction and confidence, and then second group here seeing also an explanation. With sequential approach, I would ask every single one of you to do this task where you would see first see prediction and then later on an explanation. So that's the that's the difference. Um, and th this protocol has been kind of highlighted in this uh, recent work by Shemer et al. And they also say that it's important to ask people what's their initial guess. Because if we know what their initial guess is, when we ask them to guess again, when we show them the model's prediction and confidence and maybe also explanation, we can better distangle uh, what has happened. So for example, here, if a person makes a correct prediction uh, initially, and then we show them a prediction by a model that's incorrect, then we ask them again, hey, please tell us what the answer for this question is. Uh, if they stick with their correct prediction, then there is a case of correct self-reliance. Despite seeing incorrect prediction by a model, they stick with their correct judgment which is wanted. And what would be bad is the case of over reliance where they switch to models incorrect prediction. And uh, similarly, if we had initially a person making an incorrect guess, and then they see a correct model's prediction, then we have correct reliance. And if have if they had switched to the, uh, switch, uh, excuse me, if they stick with their incorrect prediction, then we have a case uh, of uh, under reliance. So here we have, again, under-reliance, over-reliance, like before, but we also have these two additional cases of correct self-reliance and uh, correct uh, reliance in the, in the model. Uh, so yeah, so I think this protocol is, is, is good and something we have built up on our, in our recent work where I think this can be additionally improved by asking people to make a third guess. So in work by Shemmer et al, here on the, on the, when they make second guess, they show them uh, models prediction and the explanation they deem could be useful for the um, boosting reliance, but they show both the prediction and the explanation simultaneously. 
And within that, that hinders the effects of the explanation alone, because you can't tell if there was a bad, bad behavior by a person in the end, you can't tell whether it was because of seeing the prediction or because seeing the explanation. So what I think would be better, if you ask people first to make a guess by just seeing the input, then you show them the uh, model's prediction and the confidence of the model, then they make the second guess. And then you show them your explanation that you think can be helpful. And then you ask them to make the third guess in the explanation. So for example, if you have a situation where a person initially makes a correct prediction, sees incorrect uh, model's prediction, and then uh, switches, um, then uh, then uh, then switches to the incorrect uh, prediction, where we can have a case of overreliance, and then they see the model's explanation, and they still stick with this wrong prediction. We don't really know exactly how explanations had affected this person. They could be reinforcing overreliance, which is bad. They might be doing nothing. You know, person might straight up ignoring the explanation and they just stick with the incorrect model's prediction. Or they might be even good. They might, for example, imagine that we have asked people to self-report their confidence in the decisions they are making at each, each one of these steps. If they stick with the incorrect prediction, but their confidence in lowers with provision of explanation, then we can actually say, well, explanation didn't have a power to help people to stick with their initial first correct guess, but at least it had um, lowered their confidence in the bad final decision they are making. Um, so yeah, the point I wanna make here is that distangling the effect of explanation is really hard and it requires this multi-stage sequential approach to really nail down what the effect of explanation is. And in many cases, we still don't know, right? In many cases, it's still uh, unclear. But I think this is the best uh, we have right now. And I think if we also ask people to self-report their own confidence in, this, 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 in their own decisions, we can also kind of measure which one of these is happening uh, as well. Okay. So this is kind of a lot, <laughs> right? Um, but this is how these evaluations look like. And this is why people don't like doing application grounded evaluations and want to stick with uh, automatic uh, evaluations that obviously cannot tell us anything uh, about this. Okay, I will bother you with one more measurement because we have time for that. Um, and it's kind of similar to reliance. And it's also very much so related to human AI teams. And that's the idea of complementary performance. You want your human AI teams to be better than your person alone or your AI uh, alone. So it is assumed that people have their own strengths and that AI models have their own strengths. And if they work together, they can unify their strengths such that they are together better performing than either one of them alone. That's assumed. And the goal is to boost human AI team performance with explanations. And the idea that explanations have power to do so stems from uh, very similar reasons um, that we have seen with Reliance. They can counter under-reliance and over-reliance. So obviously then the performance should uh, increase uh, as well. And explanation usefulness in terms of complementary performance is measure the average rate. Um, okay, excuse me, this is, uh, this is incorrect. Um, I will delete that right away. Okay, here we'll put one DBD. So by including explanations, what you are expecting will happen is uh, human AI team performance to increase. So you will have uh, model and person performance kind of similar, then uh, team performance a little bit higher than performance of either one of those. 
and then human team performance with provision of explanations being even higher. That's that's what you want to achieve with your explanations. And then the measurement we are measuring here, uh, we have different accuracies. I'm using accuracy as the performance metric we care about. This can be F1 score or whatever, uh, precision or recall, whatever you care about. And you are measuring the difference between the accuracy you get uh, with uh, that a person had made finally, the doctor making the final diagnosis upon doctor seeing the input, the explanation for the model prediction and the model prediction. And you are measuring the difference between that accuracy and the accuracy, one of the one of these three, namely the maximum of these three accuracies. And these three accuracies are in order. The accuracy of the person that uh, that person achieves when they see input, model prediction, and your baseline explanation, for example, confidence scores, accuracy that the person sees upon seeing just the input and accuracy of the model upon seeing just the input. So you want this team performance to be higher than uh, each one of these. Um, and of course, you know, if you know that your team performance is better than this one alone, you, you don't need uh, to calculate this, but yeah, you need to know that's the case and likely you don't know that. Okay, so a few more things from the work by Bansal and Wu, obviously very important and very seminal work. Um, they say a rational developer would only deploy a team if it adds utility to the decision-making process. And basically um, what they are, what they have identified in their work is that before them, all of these works that measure the utility of explanations uh, for human AI teams, they were just checking whether the accuracy of uh, the team by adding explanation is the is higher than the accuracy of the team without explanation. But they didn't check that the team is performing better than the uh, each one of these uh, you know person and the model alone. So what had happened is that these prior studies to theirs, but actually doing this in a setups where model was performing really, really well. So there was, wasn't even a chance for human AI team to outperform the model alone. And this is a situation where they say a rational developer would not deploy a team. They would deploy a model alone because in the end, what's most important is that we make the most accurate predictions we make. Um, it doesn't matter that our explanation have any property if they, are not giving us as performance that as good as human or model alone, because in the end you will make the most damage if you are giving more incorrect predictions to uh, uh, immediate stakeholders. Um, so in their work here, uh, they show the, the, they illustrate the, the setup. So here you have. Um, let me remind myself what R stands for. So first we have a, a human, then we have a model alone, and R stands, I, recommend, uh, I remember, for recommendations. So human plus AI's prediction, we have this. So this is the uh, performance of a team, which is a little bit higher than a human. And then with explanation, we improve this, and prior work has shown, prior to theirs work, have shown that, and that's good. But this, there is still gap between this, and that still means that explanations are not good enough to uh, make human AI teams to perform better than model alone, and therefore human AI teams are not useful in practice. So this, despite showing this improvement, we still didn't achieve what is a reasonable improvement to deploy the team in practice. So this is not good enough. And what they recommend is instead of trying to improve teams by showing explanations in the setups where it's so hard to achieve models performance with the theme to instead focus on setups where model and human are kind of performing similarly. They are not so behind, you know, the, the model is not super uh, superhuman nor uh, subhuman. So in this setup, your team will be better than human or model alone and then by adding explanation, you have this great boost that 
uh, is really showing how helpful explanation and useful they are in uh, practice. So this is a practical recommendation about how to go about your experimental setups. You need to achieve this in the first place, to have a meaningful human AI team set up where human AI team can be better than human alone or, uh, or uh, model alone. While I'm on at this topic, I want to mention that human alone, like an expert, a lawyer, a doctor, with unlimited time, can be really, really good. Uh, but you might want to be interested in a setup where your doctor has very limited time and uh, their performance with very limited time may, might be very different than their performance with a lot of time to do the task. Imagine that their task is to read very long clinical note and they have 100 patients and they need to provide care for all 100 of them in 30 minutes. And they need to read this super long document that takes five minutes to read for each patient. Now they don't have all that time to take care of each one of these patients properly. So if you measure the human performance in a constrained setup, although initially with unconstrained time setup, it might have been very high, it will drop when you have constrained setup. So um, when we say human performance, yeah, it depends whether we have time constraint or un, uh, not constrained setup. And I think uh, you will all be interested. It, it's always going to be more interested to, to think about these uh, constraint time setups. They are realistic and also uh, enable this situation where human uh, AI team performance might be higher in this constrained uh, time setup. So just have that in mind that human performance can mean two things depending on the time a person has to do the task. Questions about that? Okay, let me just see what else. All right, I will finish with this. Um, I mentioned this in passing already, but besides doing this uh, studies of reliance and complementary team performance, um, people also enhance them by, by people, I mean, people conducting evaluation, they enhance them by asking people now people who are doing the evaluation task to self-report their confidence in the decisions they are making as well as their trust in the model. And these are subjective metrics because we ask people to get, you know, to assess, to self-assess their, their uh, work abilities and the abilities of the model. Um, studies differ whether they do this on a case by case uh, cases. So if you go all the back uh, to the sequential approach, um, here you can ask person at the end what their confidence is at the this you know in their final decision. After each one of the decisions they are you know making for each one of the evaluation examples, or after they have evaluated hundred examples, you can uh, give them a post task survey where you ask them how confident were you in your decisions and. Um, you know, how, how, what is your level of trust in this model? I think it's much better to ask them on a case by case basis. I don't know how much effort that additional effort that requires from evaluators. I don't deem it's too much, but then it really helps you to also distangle these additional factors of how explanation might be um, uh, influencing uh, performance. And of course, what we don't want here is that we have increased the confidence in people. Uh, while they are over relying or under relying. So they are making bad decisions, but they are feeling more confident about them. And explanations have unfortunately been shown to have this effect that people make bad decisions by provision of explanations, but their confidence in their bad decisions had increased. And we really want to avoid this situation. What we actually want to do is increase their confidence while increasing their appropriate reliance. So we want them to make good decisions, and also we want them to have better confidence in those decisions uh, they are making. Uh, so what might happen also is that you don't really improve, you know, you might have similar levels of appropriate reliance, but um, their confident, the confidence of your annotators is higher when they make right decision and lower when they make uh, bad decisions. So that can also be a positive sign of your uh, explanations. 
Okay, so we'll stop here. And then next time uh, on Monday, we'll go over some other uh, decisions we make, must make while we are conducting these application grounded evaluations involving actual people. All right, see you on Wednesday.